So every time the priests would have walked up to the, the laver of brass, they would have seen themselves. And there would have been a, a time of self-examination, <coughs> whether they had sin in their life that hadn't been reconciled, whether they needed to acknowledge that and, and an animal sacrifice be made, because some of the animal, fa- animal sacrifices that were being made were for the priests themselves. When they had sinned, they had to do various different animal sacrifices. Yeah, just a bit of an introduction I, I missed yesterday. I, afterwards, I always, when we have these things on the way home, I ask my wife, is there anything that I should have done differently, anything that I missed? And, and she couldn't think of anything. She thought it was good. And, but I, didn't, I realized I didn't even introduce us as a family. Um, so we're Frank and Sarah Dyke. We originally grew, grew up in Ontario and three years ago moved to Grand Prairie, Alberta. And um, this tabernacle ministry is something that, was going back, not me obviously, from the 60s. The original fella that did this teaching was uh, Bruce Whitford and he made his first model in the 60s. I believe it was 1962, where he as a family were taking this model around Canada and U- United States and, and down to Mexico as well. And um, a few years back, he, he died of cancer, but before he died, he asked if I'd be willing to to take on this ministry, and since then we've been, we've been doing it as opportunities arise. Uh, this would be our eighth eighth session, and we feel like every time I feel like every time that I prepare, I'm I'm redoing the slides and redoing the notes and and relearning and correcting because I feel like there's just there's so much more that can be learned. So it's definitely not something that I feel like I've I've studied exhaustively, but. Um, in these series of messages, we're just focusing on the gospel part. How, how do we see the gospel in the, in the tabernacle model? And so yesterday, as a bit of a recap for those that weren't here, we talked about the outer wall and the gate. And for uh, those that were here, maybe from the children, do we remember what white represents? Just put up your hand or call it out. Purity, purity that's right. Righteousness, purity holiness, resurrection, high priest, all those things we see in white. How about uh, red? What does red represent? That's right, blood and sin. Good memories. And how about blue? Oh, don't look at your notes. No, no, it's okay. Does anyone remember blue? That's right, blue is God. And specifically that God is superior over the whole world, that God is sovereign and, uh, and righteous in his acts. And the blue comes from the passage of scripture where God tells the priests to put this blue tassel on their garments. And every time they look at that tassel, they were supposed to remember that God is holy and to obey his commandments. That's what we see in blue. And how about purple? That's right. And when we think about royalty, what do we think about? That's right. And which king? That's right. King Jesus, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Very good listeners. I love doing this. Uh, twice we did this. We did it for a Christian school. And uh, I love especially doing it for, for children. <clears throat> and so this, this uh, sessions are broken up into four parts. Like I said yesterday, we talked about the wall that every one of us are outside of God and desiring to have a relationship with God. Every single one of these posts is sitting sitting in a socket of brass, uh, uh, reminding us that without God, we are judged, we are sinners, we we are condemned, and we need God. And the only way we can get into a relationship with God is, we, we remember what does silver represent? What does silver represent? As silver is tried in the furnace seven times, right? The word of God is purified, is pure and perfect. So silver represents the purity and perfect word of God. And it's also the price paid. So none of us were, without God, none of us are white like this cloth is. All of us are stained with sin. All of us are are outside of God and needing salvation. And the only way we can get to the other side is through a high price paid, right? Through, through a price paid for us. And we learn about that price through the perfect and pure word of God. 
And then we see that there's only one way in. The Bible says that there's, there's not many ways to God. There's one. Jesus calls himself the gate. So in the gate, we see blue. We see God. We see the king of kings. We see God in Jesus laying down his life and shedding his blood for us. But then in white, we see that Jesus didn't just stay dead, but that he resurrected from the dead. So we see prophet, king, we see the servant in the, in, the, in the way that he laid down his life, and we see the white in the resurrection, and Jesus' present place as being high priest for us in heaven. <clears throat> One way in, a 30-foot wide gate, showing that God is very desirous for all of us to come, and not just one at a time. So there's a bit of a recap from, from yesterday, and today we're going to go into the, uh, the courtyard. <clears throat> we have the um, slides up. So there, there in the slide we can see that there's, there's, there's three entrances. <clears throat> there's a 30-foot wide gate, and there's a door and the veil. And like I said yesterday, I'd like us all to ask ourselves, where in this model do we see ourselves? Do we, do we see ourselves still on the outside desiring to be in, desiring to have a relationship with God. This wall would have been about seven feet high, so it's not something you can very easily see. So without God, we are blind, really, to the truths that are in. And if we can maybe hear some things, but we're really not in, fully in a relationship with God. Today we're going to talk about the courtyard. And some of us might see ourselves still in the courtyard. I hope not, but some of us might still see ourselves there. <clears throat> so just a brief history, we're going to talk about animal sacrifices a lot today. So a brief history on animal sacrifices. We know that Adam and Eve, when they sinned, what did God do? Right? God said that the day that you sin, you will die, but then God provided animal sacrifices in their place. Those two lambs or whatever they were, they died, and in a way, right away in the, in the garden, we saw innocent dying in place of the guilty. <clears throat> and then Cain and Abel, you know, they, uh, Cain, you know, self was full of self-righteousness, but Abel, he saw that, you know, the thing that my dad, my mom and dad would have talked to us about possibly, he saw that there's something about laying down a life for the innocent, an innocent dying in a place of guilty. So Abel, he saw that, that, that I need to be atoned for, that I need my, my sins covered as well. So Abel offered up to God a more excellent sacrifice and laid down an animal and brought it to God and said, will you accept this animal sacrifice in my place? And then Noah, after the flood, would have been the next sacrifice that we read about. There could have been many more happening throughout that time. We don't know. But in the Word of God, the next sacrifice that takes place is Noah right after the flood. And then he offers up all these animal sacrifices trying to just show to God, you know, we're sorry as humanity for what has happened. Uh, accept these, these sacrifices for, for me and my family um, that we can also <clears throat> have our sins atoned for. <clears throat> and then there's about a 350-year a gap. And again, could, there could have been sacrifices happening there, but in the Word of God, it's, it's about 350 years later where Abraham offered up Isaac. Uh, on, uh, uh, well, he was about to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice when God provided again an innocent animal to die in his place. And so eventually, God many years later, uh, put structure to animal sacrifices in the tabernacle model. <clears throat> and that's where we are today in the, uh, in the courtyard, learning, learning about what happens there and why it happens and how it happens. So one thing that we see, and we don't have the, the covering of the, of the holy place and the holy of holies removed yet, but inside of the holy place and the holy of holies, what color do we see? A lot. Gold, that's right. What do we see in the courtyard? And what does brass represent? Judgment, that's right. So in the courtyard, now there's, 
whether these golden posts here would have, if the curtain would have been in front of them or behind them, the Bible doesn't make it very clear. Could very well have been that they were in front of those of those golden posts. Um, mo- the models that I looked at, we follow that, but the Word of God doesn't actually say. Uh, in the courtyard, we see brass. So in the courtyard, we see we see judgment happening. A lot of a lot of judgment. <coughs> And the first piece of furniture that we're going to look at is actually the, the laver. And it's a, this is a close-up picture of the one that we have here. Feel free to come over and take a look at it more closely in between sessions. The first item that we're going to talk about is the laver of brass. And the reason we're going to talk about it first before the altar is because that's, that's how the Word of God has it laid out. The, the, the laver of brass would have been the first piece of furniture that was being used when they would go into the courtyard. It says in um, Exodus, verse chapter 30, 18 and to 20, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash with all. And thou shalt put, in between, put it in between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. And thou shalt put water therein, and Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet there, there, therewith. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister to burn offerings made by fire unto the Lord. So whether they were planning on going into the holy place, you know, to take care of the table of shoe bread or the candlestick or, or burn incense, or whether they were going to um, do, do an animal sacrifice. Before they were supposed to do those things, they were supposed to go to the laver of brass and wash themselves there. And that, it says in the Word of God that that, that laver was put there so that God would see that they have been washed. Now, does God really need to see with his eyes? Does, could the laver have been put on the other side of the altar and would have God still seen it? For sure they would have, he would have. God sees all and knows all. In fact, they, they, they could have just you know, claimed to have washed and God could have accepted their word, but, but they had to physically wash their hands and their feet, completely washing themselves in front of the altar because in front of the the, the, car, the, the tent, so that they would know that God is watch, wa- watching me and I'm, I'm doing what I'm expected to do. So as they're, as they're washing themselves, um, I've, I'd like to see what it would look like in real life. You know, we've made this to scale as good as we can. Um, it talks about the height of it. I don't believe it talks about the breadth of the, of the wash basin, but but, it, but if we were, were to have a life-size scale model, it would be quite big. And if you would fill that with water all the way and look down in it, it would shine back like a mirror. So every time the priest would have walked up to the, the laver of brass, they would have seen themselves. And there would have been a, a time of self-examination, <clears throat> whether they had sin in their life that hadn't been reconciled, whether they needed to acknowledge that and, and an animal sacrifice be made because some of the animal, fa- animal sacrifices that were being made were for the priests themselves. When they had sinned, they had to do various different animal sacrifices. So they would have had to go in front of the wash basin every time they were going to do service for God and examine their hearts, whether they were living in sin or not. And I think it's a very good practice even for us today that when we're serving God, to just regularly examine ourselves. You know, where's my faith in Christ? Where am I, where am I walking? Is there any areas of life where, where I need to repent and, and get, my, get my heart right? But I, but I believe eventually, <coughs> eventually, you know, this, this beautiful thing that was put there as a, you know, wash yourselves that you are a sinner in, in need of a Savior, right? That's that's what God is trying to do here. He's trying to remind them that they need the Messiah, you know, all the time. Even, even one day they're washing and, and, be, and re- remembering that we need the Savior. The next day they're doing it again. And, and possibly multiple times a day as they go into the holy place, wash and remember 
that you need Jesus, that you need the Messiah, and come back out and offer an animal sacrifice. Before you do that, wash and remember that you need a Messiah, that you need Jesus, right? But eventually, um, this, this idea of washing themselves and, and reflecting on the fact that they need to be saved lost its meaning. And it's very sad that <clears throat> that, that happens, but it's, it's, it's all too common. And, and, you know, when we think of it, we can be very, uh, <clears throat> we can be judgmental in a way and say, why would they have forgotten? I mean, it was so real, it was so physical, and it was so clearly the will of God. How could they eventually just make it into a dead religious thing? But I think that we forget that even we ourselves, you know, when we get born again, I, I got born again in 2005, and it probably wasn't long after that I started forgetting some things. Why I got saved and from what I got saved. And things that were that had a lot of meaning all of a sudden didn't have that much meaning. So we can very easily fall into the same rut where something that once was really precious and, and special just sort of falls by the wayside and we ought not to let that happen, but it does all, <clears throat> all too often. <coughs> In Mark chapter 7, we have a verse that very clearly talks about that they had lost the meaning eventually. It says, and so what happened here was the disciples of Jesus didn't wash themselves ceremonially like they should have been based on the laws or that the Pharisees had given. Now, Pharisees, who knows the difference between a Pharisee and a Sadducee? Maybe from the children. What's an easy way to remember what the difference is between a Pharisee and a Sadducee? Any, anyone have a good way to remember? I'll give you a tip. Pharisees were always adding more laws than what God had originally given. And that's not fair, you see. Okay? Now, Sadducees, they were doing the opposite. They were taking things away that God had said, and that's very sad, you see. All right? So one is not fair, and the other one is sad. So Pharisees, they were adding more laws and rules and regulations than what God ever had given. Um, so eventually, they were just like washing all the time. Wash this, wash me, wash that, wash this, wash the house, wash the pot. And they were thinking that they were doing God's service by, by continually just washing. It says, and he answered and said unto them, Well said Isaiah the prophet of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things. So eventually, this idea of washing and remembering that they needed a Savior became just like washing, and that washing of everything just became a tradition, and they didn't even, weren't even doing it from their hearts anymore. They weren't doing it for the right reasons. <clears throat> and we know that the story of the, the marriage, their marriage of Cana, right, where where Jesus came, and they ran out of wine. And then the mother of Jesus came to Jesus and said, do something about this problem. We ran out of wine, right? What did Jesus do? Children, what did Jesus do? That's right. He turned, he turned water into wine. What type of container was used? What, what type of water containers did he, did he turn wine into? It says there were water pots it says and there were set six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the jews <clears throat> why would there have been six water pots anybody know what the number six represents six days thou shalt work but on the seventh thou shalt rest right so there were six water pots of stone that were being used for purifying. I'm imagining that there was one for every day of the week except for Sunday, because on Sunday you don't work. So Jesus, he knows that they've lost the meaning behind the washing, 
And so what does he do? He says, fill those six water pots to the brim, right to the top. And then he turns that water into wine. What color is wine typically? What does red mean? And blood, right? So he, I believe Jesus was trying to bring them back to remember. It wasn't about just washing. It was about expressing your need of being saved. And, and, and then he was giving them a hint. There will be one final washing that will take place. <clears throat> and it won't be with water anymore. It will be by blood. Now, I don't know what type of stone these pots are made out of. But typically, you pour red wine onto something, it gets stained that way. So I believe that those water pots probably were just used for water all the time. And now they've been marred with blood. They've been stained red. And the next day, whether the next day was a Sunday, maybe the day after, I don't know. But they probably would have looked and said, Huh, we can't use these anymore. They've been, they've been messed up. They've been, they've been stained. It's going to always smell like wine every time we, we wash ourselves. Or well, maybe Jesus was trying to set something back. And Jesus also said in verse 10, it says, of chapter 2, Thou hast kept the good wine until now, right? So Jesus was saying, when the, when the, when the, when the governor of the feast came, they said, usually people uh, serve the better wine first, and then the worst li- wine later when people are well drunken. But thou hast kept the best wine until now, and truly the best wine, the best way of purification came through Jesus. Reminds me of uh, 1 Peter, chapter 1. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition from your fathers, but rather with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So we'll talk about the altar now. The next piece of furniture that would have been used in the courtyard. What type of material is this made out of? What does brass represent? Judgment. Judgment, that's right. It says in Exodus chapter 27, And thou shalt make an altar of shit and wood, so it was made of wood, five cubits long, five cubits uh, wide, The altar um, should be four square, and the height thereof three cubits. And thou shalt make horns upon it from the four corners. His horns shall be the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. So this altar was made of wood, but then completely overlaid with brass. Again, showing the earthly taking on judgment, being completely covered in judgment. When you think of wood, I want us to think of earthly. We were all earthly before being saved, and there was judgment on us. We were completely judged uh, being outside of God and without salvation. So in in feet, this in size, foot-wise, this altar would have been about seven and a half feet square and four and a half feet high. So it would have been a big piece of furniture. So this table, are these eight-foot tables? Probably are, right? So it's about that size and length and width and then about that high. So it would have been a big, big piece of furniture in that that courtyard. And the Bible also says that there's supposed to be horns on the corners of that altar. Now we, we pointed them inwards just because we didn't want those fragile tips to be broken and some of them already did. It's all 3D printed and very fragile. It's, whether they're pointing inward and outward, the Bible doesn't say, but it just says that there were supposed to be four horns on the corner of that altar. <clears throat> when we think of horns, what do we think of? Some might say a rhino, but I think most people will probably think of a bull, right? Of a bull. And um, have, has anyone ever watched any videos of the, of the bulls running in Spain? 
You know, the, in Spain, every year, I think it's in July, they have the running of the bulls, right? They, they block off the streets and so that the bulls have to run through this certain path and there's all these people running and trying to outrun these bulls. And every year, there's people that get hurt and probably die in that, that crazy, crazy tradition. But what's the natural thing that we do when, when we see a bull has charged into a group of people and we're wondering, I wonder, we're wondering if somebody got hurt I think that the natural thing that we kind of do is we look at the horns of the bull and we, and we look for blood. And it's, it's very interesting that in the Bible, the, the, when these horns are mentioned, 11 times it talks about that when they were doing the animal sacrifices, they were supposed to put some of the blood on the tips of those horns. And I, so I believe that what that was supposed to represent and remind them was that judgment has taken place something has died here like a bull has attacked and killed something so they're supposed to take blood and and put it on the tips of those horns and on the day of atonement there it specifically says that when the two animals were brought to the to the altar they were going to cast lots and we'll get into that more later but there these two animals were brought to the altar and they were going to cast lots for these animals one was going to be an animal sac- or, or a blood sacrifice and the other one was going to be taken into the wilderness, God said, God instructed them to tie these animals to the horns of, those, of that altar. So in a way, they were supposed to see that judgment is coming, and then after the sacrifice, the, the death has occurred. This sacrifices, these sacrifices that were happening here around the altar, it would have been a very, very bloody scene. It wasn't filled with a lot of hope. It was the opposite of that. It would have been very, very bloody. And in in Exodus chapter 29, it talks about it. It says, Then thou shalt kill the ram and take his blood and put it upon the tip of the right ear of Aaron, or the high priest at the time, and upon the tip of the ear of his sons, and upon the thumb of their right hand, and upon the great toe of of their right foot, and sprinkle the blood upon the altar, around the altar. Thou shalt take the blood that is upon the altar and the anointing oil and sprinkle it upon Aaron and upon his garments and his sons and upon their garments and sons, and, and he shall be hallowed in his garments and his sons and their sons' garments with them. Sounds very bloody. Not just blood on the tip of the altar, but on the right ear, on the right foot, toe on the right thumb and then sprinkled their garments their, him and their sons like there would have just been there would have just been blood everywhere just like in that picture we'd have just seen blood <clears throat> it would have been a very bloody scene but one thing that that kind of s- stuck out at me was that God specifically said that the high priest was supposed to have blood applied to his ear upon his thumb, upon his foot. Now, as I was trying to think of that, remember, we started this series, those that weren't here yesterday, Jesus was on the road to Emmaus after he was resurrected from the dead, and he met these two strangers walking along the road, and Jesus began to speak to them from the beginning of Moses all the things that pertain to himself. So Jesus, with these strangers, was telling them, Back in the Old Testament, when this was happening, when that was happening, that was me. So I believe that Jesus could have, could have said to them, whether he did or not, the Bible doesn't say, Jesus could have said to the stranger, remember when the high priest had blood applied to the ear? That was pointed to the crown of thorns put on my head, blood running down my head. Remember how the, how the blood was applied to the hand, that was pointing to the nails that were pierced through my hand. Remember the blood that was applied to the foot? My feet were pierced for you as well. So it was just amazing to me to think that even in that, they would have been told, blood on the ear, blood on the hand, blood on the feet. Why? They wouldn't have known. They would have no clue. But all the while, it could have been another beautiful shadow pointing to that one sacrifice that would one day come for all mankind. 
<clears throat> so in the courtyard for today's session, we're going to talk about daily sacrifices. So there was daily animal sacrifices happening in the courtyard. Then once a year, and we'll talk about later on at 2 o'clock, was the Day of Atonement. And yesterday I, I'd asked that if there's any session that you can't miss, it's the 2 o'clock session. That's the one where we're really going to get down to the hope and truth of the gospel. But I put this slide up. I just put a last minute slide up here just to really enforce something and try to get, cause you guys, especially the kids, to remember. So the daily sacrifices, and I don't have time to read all the scriptures, but there were specific sins being confessed and then specific sacrifices made for those sins. If there's one thing from today's session that I want you to remember, it's that. That the daily sacrifices compared to the Day of Atonement, one specific thing about the daily sacrifices is that they were confessing actual sins, and then there was the appropriate sacrifice made for that sin. Okay, and I think that when you see the, when we go to the two o'clock session, you'll understand why. Uh, some examples. There was, if there was a sin done in ignorance, there was confession made and a certain sacrifice. When a priest had sin compared to um, regular folks, there was a specific confession and a certain sacrifice. If the whole congregation sinned together, if it was ignorance, it was one type of sacrifice. If it was done willingly, it was a different type of sacrifice. And it, it says if a ruler sins compared to someone that's just a worker, there was different sacrifices for different sins. There was confessions made. So they would have had to come to the priest and not just say, I'm a sinner in need of atonement. They would have to specifically say why. They are, in what way they sinned, what they actually did, not just a general, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, but why, do you, why did you come to me today? And they would have had to explain to the high priest, and then a sacrifice would have been made accordingly. So just remember that. Um, the high priest, he had in his breastplate, and we'll look at the, the, the clothing of the high priest, he had in his breastplate two stones called the Urim and Thummim, if, I, if I'm pronouncing that right. There was two stones inside the breastplate, one black stone and one white stone. And if there were two people coming to the high priest with a dispute and, and one was saying he's the guilty party and he's the guilty, or he is or she is, and they're having this argument, there was obviously sin that took place and an atonement need to be made, but the priest himself couldn't judge which one was guilty, which one needed to be atoned for, um, then he would reach into his breastplate and pray and and then grab a stone. They were smooth stones. The priest couldn't tell which one was which. And he'd pull out, open his hand. And if it was black, he was guilty. If it was white, he wasn't. So that was the Urim and Thummim. And then there was a specific off offering made for that sin. So that was a very, very interesting things. So then, <clears throat> going into Leviticus chapter 3, what was actually happening here at that altar? It says here that... Um, he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. So they're supposed to go in front of the altar, in front of the tabernacle of the congregation, lay their head upon that animal and kill it. And Aaron's sons shall, shall, excuse me, shall sprinkle the blood thereof round about the, excuse me, the altar. So this idea of laying their hand on. If you, if you do a, uh, a Bible search on laying hand on head, if you are hand on head and you'd look for all the verses in the Bible that talk about laying the hand on the head, it's always transferring guilt onto the person. And when I looked at that, I was like, wow, that's, that's very interesting. And uh, one verse... In Leviticus chapter 24, spells it out very clearly. It says, so here we have a case where a young man or some young men had done some horrible sins. 
And it says, bring forth him, the person that has sinned. Bring this person out without the camp and let all that heard him lay their hands upon his head and let it and let all that the congregation let all the congregation stone him and thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel saying whosoever curseth God shall bear his sin so when they laid hands upon that 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 man that cursed God they were they were laying their hand on the head to saying you are going to bear your sin and be judged as a sinner for this thing that was, that has done so it's an openly acknowledgement that the sin bearer is here, and we're acknowledging that by putting our hand, hand upon the head of that person, or in the case of the animal sacrifices, the animal sacrifices. So again, I go back to one of the things I mentioned earlier. I wonder how long it would have taken for people to eventually forget some of those meanings. Uh, the tabernacle was first erected 1,445 B.C. So about 1,400 years before Christ, the tabernacle was first erected. And then in the book of Isaiah, at about 740 B.C., so about 700 years later, Isaiah wrote, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, saith the Lord? He said, I am full of burnt offerings of rams and fat fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks and the lambs and he goes. So eventually this animal sacrifice that was happening here, we know 700 years later God is like, I'm tired of it. And why, would God have, why would God have said that? The only reason I believe that Isaiah would have said that was because they weren't remembering the meaning. They weren't realizing again that when we're bringing these animals to that altar to be sacrificed, I am saying, I was the sinner in need of a savior. And then putting our hand on the animal and saying, I'm transferring my guilt, my sin, onto that animal, that that animal would die in my place. Eventually, they lost the meaning. It just became, again, a tradition. And we see that too with Jesus when he went to, into the temple and he was overthrowing the tables because they were buying and selling sheep. Oh, you come from a different country? Yeah, you can exchange your money here so you can buy those doves or that animal or that lamb as a sacrifice for you. And all became, all became about money again. So many times that's what happens. Is the meaning is lost and then God steps in and says, no, it's, it's, it's done. So I believe, obviously, that if Jesus was on the road to Emmaus for those young men, or those men on the road to Emmaus, and then he talked about the animal sacrifices that were happening there, if Jesus went back to the Garden of Eden, I believe Jesus would have said something like, the innocent animals dying in the place of the guilty was pointing to me. When Cain and Abel, when Abel offered up a more excellent sacrifice. That was pointing to my sacrifice for you. When Noah offered up all those animals, that was pointing to me being offered up. When Abraham was about to offer up his one and only son to die, that was pointing to, to me. When that innocent animal that was caught in the, thor- in the horns died instead of Isaac, that was pointing to me. And then 700 plus years of regulated animal sacrifices, but then eventually, eventually, as sad as it is, they forgot their meaning. So the animal sacrifices that were happening here, there was two main things that they were supposed to do. They were supposed to magnify our sin. They were supposed to show that you're not just a little sinner. You're not just, you know, not quite making the mark. You are indeed such a sinner that God cannot see eternal life granted to you, that there is eternal condemnation coming to you. They were supposed to, it was supposed to magnify our sin. The blood on the horn, the blood on the ear, the blood on the hand, the blood on the foot, the blood on the, on the garments, the blood around the altar, the blood brought into the top, we'll see later on, <coughs> into the tent. <coughs> 
<coughs> all this blood shed was to magnify our sin and at the same time point us to Jesus, that we are supposed to have hope and belief in something a lot better to come. Romans 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So these laws, ordinances, traditions like this, was only supposed to bring the knowledge of sin. Paul said in Romans chapter 7 that, I was alive once. When I was young, I was just like, yes, life is good. And I did sins, but I didn't realize that I had sinned until the commandment came. And then I realized I'm a sinner and I'm, I'm, I'm going to die for that sin. Hebrews 10, 4 and 5. For it is impos- not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Right? So the blood of goats, the offerings that are happening here, one, one very sad thing about the daily sacrifices that were happening here uh, that is that people would be coming to the priest, confessing their sins. They'd see this innocent animal die in their place. The blood sprinkled all around. But you know what? The saddest thing that, that would happen here is that the people would walk away still feeling guilty. Now, all that for me. <clears throat> and my conscience is still plagued. I still feel like I'm, like I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. But God's work was being done. And I believe that the daily sacrifices that were happening here in the courtyard, they're a very good picture of the old covenant. This do and thou shalt live and this is, the, this is the consequences of this and this and this and so on and so forth. But then the new covenant is that he did and because of that we can live. So it's very different. Very different. In fact, um, John the Baptist, when he was on the scene, he was still preaching old covenant. They were going to him and confessing their sins. Specific sins. Why, why do you think you need saving? Well, because of this and this and this and this. And then they would be baptized in water showing that they needed a Savior. I was baptized in that type of baptism. When we wanted to get married, we went to the preacher or the priest or the whatever you call it in English, predia. And it was about confessing all your sins, specific sins, and then make a commitment to try to do better And then keep trying to do better until the day you get baptized. And if you get baptized, you sin between the time that you got baptized. It's just like the daily sacrifice system. If you sinned again between the time that you got baptized, actually confess again, right? And then and then and then be forgiven again. And it was the same type of thing. And 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 I don't ever remember leaving those confessions and feeling guiltless. It was just the same thing over and over again. But in the new covenant. It's not confessing specific sins. And we'll talk about that on the Day of Atonement. It is, I am a sinner in need of a Savior and God wiping them all away, those that I remember and those that I don't. Very, very, very different. So the Day of Atonement was not good news. Oh, sorry. The Day of Sacrifices were not pointing to good news, but rather just a repeated remembrance that we needed saving. Isaiah 53, 10 and 11. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Right? So Isaiah was seeing this, that no, this... These animal sacrifices are pointing to something else. There is going to be one final sacrifice that was going to bear the sins and iniquities of all that would come to him. (coughs) And then finally, 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake made him, 
For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Like Just let that sink in. Right, Those animal sacrifices, those innocent animals over and over and over again. How many sacrifices happen in a day? I don't know, but just sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. And then finally God says, I am going to make my son sin. And he knew no sin. I'm sure that even the, the, the lamb without blemish, if they looked long enough, they could probably find something right? It had to be something that wasn't deformed, that looked pure, but I'm sure that if they looked close enough, they probably could find something. A few hairs at a place, whatever it would be, right? But not with Jesus. Jesus was perfect, and because of that, he was able to be the one that could be resurrected, to bear the sins and be resurrected for us. So that's good news coming is that Jesus was the one and it says in Romans that because of the holiness of God Jesus Christ was declared to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness that's a big verse I should have put that on the wall but that's a big verse God Jesus was declared confirmed you know that he was in fact the very son of God through the resurrection. Now how was it that we can know that Jesus was the Son of God that took our sins? How, is it, how does the resurrection prove that? It says it right in that verse. It says, according to the spirit of holiness. Meaning that God is righteous and even though Jesus became the sin bearer <coughs> for us and died with our sins on him. When the account would have been examined, when Jesus' life would have been looked at, would God have found sin in Jesus' life? Children? Would God have found sin in Jesus' life? No. He found our sins in Jesus' life. Not Jesus' sins, because he had none. And because God is holy, God had to Is there some things that God can't do? Yes. God could not leave Jesus as dead because Jesus himself didn't sin, so therefore the wages of sin is death, and Jesus didn't sin because God is holy. Jesus had to be resurrected from the dead. But the good news is that our sins didn't resurrect back up with him. That our old man was crucified with Jesus and stayed dead. And that is why we have hope. There's more good news coming, like I said, in session two. We'll talk about um, the Day of Atonement and how the Day of Atonement is quite a bit different than the daily sacrifices that were happening here. So let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, that, again, we see so many things here in this courtyard that are pointing to you. Father, maybe there's still some in this in this building, in this room, that are still trying to clean themselves up. They're confessing over and over and over again, trying over and over again, and and are still feeling guilt, and they don't understand. Father, we pray that any of those that are in this in this sense of of of, of hopelessness and, and and blind and and not understanding why they can't get free from this guilt, that they would come to you, that they would look to Jesus as the one that was lifted up in the serpent of the wilderness, the one that became sin for us who knew no sin, and see there is hope and there is life. Father, we pray again as believers that we would never forget the things that you have done for us, that we never forget the meanings behind this life that we have, that we would never forget the true meaning of Christ and the cross and the gospel, that we wouldn't do as so many have done, that eventually it just becomes old and boring, 
but that it would be refreshed in our hearts so that we could have that hope ready to share with those that are wanting to hear. We pray that you bless the rest of our time. Bless this morning, bless the afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.